running day 275, also first in the morning. Whatsoever happens at the center of your being starts affecting the subconscious. If your house is dark, of course your windows and your doors will all show darkness. And if you burn a candle inside, then from the window, from the door, the light will start reaching the outside. From far away, a person who is lost in the jungle in the darkness will find solace, consolation, or direction because your house is lit with a small candle. He will start moving towards you, but if the house is dark, then he will not be able to find it. Whenever one becomes blissful, one becomes full of light. Misery is darkness, bliss is light. And you can see the blissful person radiating. He is luminous. Something of his innermost core starts filtering out of the body too, and that gives immense beauty. Two seventy six. We are we are made of light. The whole existence of man is made of light, and yet the very puzzling phenomenon is that we live in darkness. It is really unbelievable how we manage to live in darkness. It is a feat. We are all doing a great miracle. We are made of light, and yet we are living in darkness. The reason is that we never watch ourselves. We watch everybody else. We go on looking here and there. Our our eyes are constantly running from one object to another object, but they never become still and silent to have a glimpse, a little glimpse of our own being. And just that little glimpse transforms, wakes you up. What's that number? 276. Mm. 277. Ordinarily, man is unconscious. Just a small part has become conscious. A very tiny part, very flickering. At any moment, if there is any small incident, you will be unconscious. Somebody treads on your toes and you are unconscious. Somebody hits you and you are unconscious. Somebody insults you, looks at you with anger and you are unconscious. A beautiful woman passes by and you are unconscious. Your consciousness is not much. It is just very familiar phenomenon. You are carrying a vast continent of unconsciousness within that has to be transformed. When your whole being becomes conscious, when nothing can make you unconscious, when even in deep sleep the consciousness remains as subtle as a subtle background, as a backdrop, then one has come home. Two seventy eight. God cannot be proved. No argument is possible either for or against. But if one grows in consciousness, one starts feeling God. As you grow more and more in consciousness, you become aware that things are disappearing. Matter is disappearing, and instead of matter, the universe starts appearing to be divine, to be consciousness. It is a simple law. The world appears to be matter because you think of yourself as the body. Whatsoever you are, you, you will think the world is. If you think you are the body, the world is matter. There is no God. If you think you are the soul, if you experience yourself as consciousness, immediately the world is experienced as consciousness. The world is a mirror. Whatsoever you are, it reflects back. So you get only that which you deserve. Become more conscious and the world becomes conscious with you. When you are at the peak of your consciousness, the world disappears as matter. It is transformed into godliness. That is the ultimate experience of truth, of love, of bliss. I've noticed this in his readings before. I don't know if I'm imagining it, but it's made it clearly the, the writings have a flow to them. They're not just like random, they don't feel like random thoughts. They feel like they're all connected. Even now, like I'm pulling out this theme of this idea of light and dark, consciousness, not consciousness, um, that type of transformation. Threads it together. I love that idea of lighting a candle within you so people can see you. Mm -hmm. That's powerful, right? I mean, yes. Because it it just so effectively states that you you create your world.
279. Ordinarily, man is very cruel, crueler than any other animal, more anim animalistic than any other animal. Man in his unconsciousness is far below the animal kingdom because no animal kills its own species except man. No animal kills just for play. Among animals, there are no hunters. They kill when they are hungry, otherwise not. Man kills just as a game. That seems to be the ultimate in cruelty. Destroying life just to keep yourself occupied. But as you become more conscious of your cruelty, of your violence, gross and subtle, you start becoming more and more compassionate. Not that you cultivate compassion just by becoming aware of your cruelty, violence, ugliness. The very awareness brings changes in you. And the energy that was involved in cruelty and violence starts changing. The same energy becomes purified. The same energy becomes compassion. No other animal is compassionate either. Hence, man can fall below the animals and can rise above the gods. That is the beauty of man, his splendor, his glory. He has a vast spectrum. The whole universe is available to him. He can be the lowest and he can be the highest. <clears throat> 280. Truth cannot be transferred. That is one of its intrinsic qualities. My truth cannot become your truth. The moment I give it to you, in that very moment, it becomes false. It is like uprooting a tree. The moment you uproot it, it is dead. It is alive only when it is rooted, and the tr tree of truth cannot be transplanted. You cannot put it in another soil. So Buddha's truth dies with Buddha, and Jesus' truth dies with Jesus. Christianity is a false phenomenon, so is Buddhism. Each person has to discover his own truth. Learn from Buddha the possibility of truth. Learn from Buddha the hope. Learn from Buddha the confidence. Yes, it is possible. It is possible for one person. Why not me? But don't try to borrow because whatsoever you borrow is nothing but words. It won't have any meaning in your life. Meaning comes from experience. That highlights that difference you made between believing in something versus knowing something. Buddha is reported to have said that lies are sweet in the beginning and bitter in the end. Truth is bitter in the beginning and sweet in the end. And he is right, absolutely right. Truth is bitter. It is not that truth is bitter, but because we have lived in lies for so long, when truth comes, our lies are shattered and it hurts. Truth never compromises. When it comes, all lies are bound to be shattered. In the beginning, it creates chaos. But out of that chaos, stars are born. Out of that chaos comes creativity. So only very few daring souls have known the truth. Others have lived coddled with their lives, holding the toys, their teddy bears, clinging to comfortable ideas. For example, man is afraid of death. Because he is afraid of death, knowing nothing of immortality, he clings to the idea of it. He does not even know what life is. Although he is alive, he does not know what death is. Although he has died many times, but he clings to the idea of immortality. People come to me and, and ask, what happens after death? I tell them, first try to know what happens before death. You are alive right now, and your concern should be with what life is. Do you know what life is? They, they say that they don't know, and they are interested in knowing about something which has not yet happened. After death, what happens? If you know what life is, if you know that which is right now, you will be able to use that same awareness when death comes. It is the same awareness, awareness, the same mirror that reflects life will reflect death. And if you are aware, there is no death, there is no birth, there is only eternity. But that has to be experienced, not just an idea. Two eighty two. I don't teach any philosophy here. I don't teach any dogma creed. My whole teaching consists of experimenting, of experiencing, of going within yourself with an open mind, with no belief, because every belief will be an obstruction to knowing the truth. Every belief is inimical to the inquiry for truth. So don't be a Christian or a Hindu or a Muhammadan. Don't be a theist or an atheist. There is no need because you don't know anything. Just know. I don't know and go inside with that state of mind. Just like an innocent child who knows nothing, if one can enter one's being like a child, innocent, and if one can function from a state of not knowing, then it's not far away, it is very close by. The moment you know your being, you have found the key, the master key which can unlock many, many doors. In fact, that one key is enough to unlock all the doors. I call that key the truth, your truth, your experience the truth. So drop all beliefs, drop all lies which others have taught you, 
and go innocently, empty, knowing nothing. Soon you will find a great treasure, a great wisdom within yourself. It is already there just waiting for you to come empty-handed. Meditation means going inside empty-handed, empty of all belief, of all knowledge. Conceived idea that you have, if you drop it, you learn. The base word of belief is lie. <laughs> Any idea? <laughs> I should have studied my English better. <laughs> <laughs> idea, oh, I'm a boxer, or oh, you know, I'm a kickboxer, or I practice taekwondo, or you, you come in with a set of ideas, and then you get molded to that, those beliefs of what you think will work, but if you go in there with nothing, and you just do what you think works, then it's based off of freedom, but the thing is, just because you're free doesn't mean that you'll be effective, so... If you start getting hit a lot and you're not being, you know, you're not effective in defending yourself, then you're gonna search through the truth on what it takes to defend yourself, and based on that search, then you'll come upon certain um, an understanding of what is truth to you and what isn't, what works and what doesn't work, and that has no label to it. So you're not a boxer, you're not like, you know, you know you're not a wrestler, you're not like. Putting a label, imposing a label on yourself to set limitations. You're just somebody who, who is, who can effectively defend themselves during situations of danger. And I would categorize that like as a martial artist who isn't bounded by any, you know, isn't limited by anything, you know. Um, and when when you say kung fu, it doesn't it doesn't, the meaning of it is is like discipline to better yourself. So. Even if you say you practice Kung Fu, you're not really limiting yourself to a specific practice, you know, because essentially, you know, like I like to play billards, for example. If I get really good at billards, that's, that's a Kung Fu right there. Or sparring, I get good at sparring, I get good at weightlifting, I get good at running, it's all Kung Fu. So Kung Fu doesn't limit you into any specific way, but a lot of other disciplines, they would limit you and say, you know, if you're a wrestler, then what you doing punching? You know, if you're a boxer, what are you doing kicking? If you're practicing Taekwondo, then what are you doing, you know, you know, doing these sets, you know, these sorts of moves or doing arm locks or whatnot. Every single style usually will have their limitations and their beliefs and what they think will work and what won't work. But if you start to believe those things, um, you're not experiencing the truth yourself. But once you start sparring and, um, you prove to yourself what's effective and what isn't, then you know the truth for yourself at least. You do not necessarily know the truth for other people because other people have different abilities and different, um, you know, they, they have different body types and um, they react differently. You know, they, they might not be, um, react the same way that you react. So, sparring kind of challenges everybody to kind of discover for themselves what is effective from them, and that's like what I like about the way that we spar is, you know, usually I don't, I don't really tell you what to do, I just say, you know, try to do what you think will work, and then when you try it, then you'll see, you'll come a little bit closer to what is truth, and then we'll start training in drills, and certain techniques to give you um, more tools to work with, you know, kind of like somebody who's a carpenter, who has all these different tools and he knows which tool to use at which moment. And then like a martial artist, when you learn like all these different kicks and all these different punches, all these different locks and all these different takedowns, all these different techniques, you kind of learn which technique to use at which moment. And you're not limited by anything, you know. So it goes hand in hand with what Osho was talking about as far as like wisdom is concerned and finding the true way. And when I started to learn 
I got deeper into the martial arts, it really gave me a deeper understanding of religions and um, spirituality and just, you know, conflict amongst groups of people. Um, martial, artists, martial arts taught me to kind of be myself and not depend on any group to show me the truth or the way. It's, it, it helps you get into your individual discovery of what you see as truth. And that's the same way with the sparring, you know. So, sir, go ahead. I was just going to say, so I've always had this impression you don't like MMA. Yeah. Well, why don't you like MMA? Because MMA really is mixing multiple stuff, right? Like Krav Maga. No, it's, you... it's not because of the way that it's being expressed. They associate MMA with the cage. So you, so, but there is a difference between MMA and cage fight, right? I mean... They associate both to be the same. So when they say MMA, automatically start thinking of a cage. And that's the problem. Truly mixed martial arts would have no restrictions. So basically the cage imposes the rules of what is allowed in there. Mm -hmm. So you can't bring it, like Filipino stick fight in Kali, you can't go in the cage. Right. People that specialize in any sort of weapons, like anything, katanas, guns or whatever, sticks, knives, cannot go in that cage. In addition, even with unarmed combat, there's a lot of rules. If you look into it, a lot of things that you can't do when somebody is trying to attack you. So like a lot of things that we do, like I'll, I, I'll just grab them by right. the throat and pull in their hair. There's like a lot of foul, all like the foul techniques are not allowed in there. Right. Even if you take the gloves off, you're not allowed to go in the cage. Right. You wear shoes, you're not allowed to go in there. So. There's a lot of restrictions, and how can you call that mixed martial arts? Because it's not truly mixed. And if it was truly mixed, why do you even have to say mixed? You just say martial arts. Because martial arts is supposed to encompass everything. So everything that we practice in here is supposed to be martial arts. So yesterday we worked on the bow staff. So we worked on that for about almost an hour. So that's martial arts. That's part of martial arts. Well. Why isn't it a part of mixed martial arts? And that's the problem is they, they impose this. Basically, the only things that are allowed in the cage are disciplines that will adhere to the rules within that cage, which they will use Muay Thai, boxing, jiu -jitsu. wrestling, Jiu Jitsu. Those are the four names. So when they say mixed, they're pretty much just mixing four different combat sports. But when you look into the, the history of the martial arts, which incorporates everything all over the world, you look at a lot of the Chinese martial arts systems, a lot of them, a part of their system will have at least some sort of weapon. Mm -hmm. So you see the Shaolin monks are known for their bow staffs. Bruce Lee was known for his nunchucks. Wing Chun would have maybe like butterfly swords or something. Like every single, usually Kung Fu, will work on some sort of weapon. And weapons bring in more of the reality. So. There's never any weapons allowed in the cage, and there's never allowed any multiple opponents. So you can't fight a two against one ever. You can't fight a different gender. You can't fight a different weight class. You can't fight a different skill level. There's too many restrictions. It's, it's basically calling... It's like saying that the, the, the Earth is the universe. It's not. The universe is vast. The Earth is just part of the universe. So when they say mixed martial arts, it might not be as limited as wrestling because it incorporates boxing and kickboxing, but it's still very limited compared to the vast. So martial arts is, is supposed to incorporate every single martial art that's ever existed. So that includes cake, you know, that include, includes mixed martial arts, that includes jiu-jitsu, that includes karate, it includes all forms of kung fu, it includes Jeet Kune Do, it includes Judo, it includes everything that has ever been existed. That's what martial arts is. So mixed martial arts is just essentially just a um, way to exploit the martial arts for profit purposes. So they'll adjust the rules according to what is allowed to, to, to use as a form of entertainment and to profit. So the law makers will be like, well, if you guys don't wear gloves, it's a little too violent, so we're not going to allow you to have your event if you guys don't use gloves. Right. And then they'll be like, well, okay, fine, we'll, we'll wear gloves, and we'll touch gloves, and we're not going to spit on each other, we're not going to yell profanities at each other, we're going to um, fight res so-called respectfully. Um, I think mixed martial arts is the only 
combat sport that allows someone to strike somebody that's grounded. And that to me is a very um, excessive and um, it's, it's not a good way to promote combat sport. It's unsportsmanlike. So it's like changing the rules of basketball and saying, oh yeah, if you want to, while he's trying to dunk, go ahead and punch him in the face. That's fine. But that's not a part of the sport. That's not something that's a skill that's developing that skill set for the sport. So I don't respect MMA because mainly because of the ground fighting like that. But I respect boxing because at least you can't hit the person when they're on the ground. Mm. You know, boxing's been around so much longer. The rules, boxing is still j dangerous, very dangerous. Maybe even more, just as dangerous as the cage fight. But, but because it goes longer rounds. But I just respect the rules in boxing more as a combat sport. But I don't respect MMA as an art. I don't respect it as a sport either because of the rules. Um, but I promote the true martial arts. And I always um, side with and promote Bruce Lee's teachings because I feel that he was, um, he was pure and loyal to the, rule, you know, the real martial arts with no limitations. So Bruce would always say, you know, he even engraved it, in, he even had it engraved in his um, grave, you know, use no limitation as limitation. So, you know, if somebody's attacking you in the street, you know, who can say what you can and can't do to defend your life? But MMA doesn't teach you that. MMA will teach you, well, you can't do that move because it's not allowed. You know, and that's not real, you know, so. Although on the street, if you fall on the ground, the dude's coming after you. Not necessarily. On the streets, guns are involved. Well, yeah. You know, and if you're a stand-up fighter, if you're a stand-up fighter and the person that you're fighting on the streets is a stand-up fighter, nobody wants to go on the ground. You know, so because MMA, if you keep watching that, it makes you think that all fights end up on the ground because you keep watching that. So your world becomes restricted to what you expose yourself to. Um, if you read in the newspapers, you read in the articles, you watch the news, what's going on out there in the streets is usually shootings. It has nothing to do with fist fights. So martial artists, they're not just violent people that just go around shooting people, but they would fight respectfully uh, and with, you know, basically to test their abilities and with self-control. So I'm not saying don't ground fight, but the way that they're ground fighting is not something that I agree to. Like we even ground fight in here. Mm -hmm. But it's the, we do it differently. So what I'm saying is if you're going to ground fight, then ground fight for real. So if somebody has a knife and you want to take them down to the ground and they stab and kill you, well, that's the reality of ground fighting. Let the people know the reality. Don't make them think that it's okay to take somebody down to the ground and everything is going to be okay. Uh, the reality is if, if you try to take somebody down to the ground, they could take your life away right away with just one choke. So, there's no second chances. The reality of ground fighting is very deadly if you let, if you truly let there, there be no rules. And they're not properly educating the public when they show people fighting in the cage with all these hidden rules, making people think that certain techniques are more effective than they really are. So if you make these people fight without gloves, before it even got to the ground, there's a good chance the fight would have ended even before it got to the ground because of the powerfulness of, a, of punching. Mm -hmm. So if you take the, the gloves off these people, and it even already happens in the cage. A lot of the fights even end before it even goes in the ground because they're getting better at learning how to counter the ground fighter. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying this not real the real science of fight that kid whatever they're doing in that cage is not the real science and it's not even a respectable sport in my eyes you know um and it's distorting the people's idea, you know understanding of what real martial arts is mm -hmm. and it's also it's it's hypnotizing people to play fight in a very dangerous way so normally Rather than saying, you know, I give up, I don't want to fight anymore, somebody falls to the ground. And then rather than being waiting for him to get back up and have him to fight again, you keep hitting him and hitting and hitting and then you don't stop until the referee pulls you away or until the police show up. That's not, that's not a, 
a good form of control as far as um, having a trained response to know when to stop. Mm -hmm. So we're trained to stop when we see a red light, we stop. We're trained to do that. Imagine that they switch, switched it. Alright, stop in the green light now. Go on the red. It's going to be hard to switch that because it's been so long to stop when we see a red light. So boxing teaches people to stop when they hit the ground. At least wait for them to get back up before you beat their ass again. But in case fighting, it's not like that. You knock him down, you are required to beat him down until the ref pulls you away. And that's not training your, your automated responses in something that's going to be healthy for the streets. Because now you become excessive with your force, and then now you could be the one in jail. Because even though you had the right to defend yourself, you didn't have the right to beat that person down after he no longer became a threat. So... That's like teaching people, don't just shoot him one time, but shoot him, like, just empty the clip on him. Regardless of the situation, no matter what happens, just empty the clip on him until he's, to make sure that he's dead. And that's kind of what cage fighting is teaching people, is be excessive. Don't hold back whatsoever. Just beat him down until he's just dead. And I don't respect that. That's not martial arts. Mm -hmm. You know, so I have big beef with MMA. Huge beef because it's not representing the spirit of the martial arts in any way, shape, or form. And they try to say, oh, you know, MMA was, the, you know, the father of MMA is Bruce Lee. That's bullshit. You know, Bruce Lee was the father of Jeet Kune Do, not MMA. There's a huge difference between Dao, Jeet Kune Do, and MMA, mixed martial arts. Completely different. So people that don't understand that need to study the teaching of the martial arts and then they'll start to understand. It. But it's not the same at all. MMA does not have the meditation, it doesn't have the spirituality, it doesn't have the respect, it's just, there's just a lot of things that it doesn't have, um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be hard to admit for America to grasp the idea of learning to have self-control, even though you are a destructive force, but you still got to learn how to control yourself, and people just don't grasp that understanding, because they get rewarded for beating people down. So it's, it's enticing to go into a cage and beat somebody down for like millions of dollars. It's very enticing. But it's not the martial arts. That's not what martial arts would do. You know, it's, 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 it goes against the, the idea of, and the principles of what it's supposed to stand for. So it's like, the way that I see martial arts is like a gun. You only use it when you really do need to. And when you need to, and you do use it, well, you're still going to have to prove it to the courts why you used it to make sure and then you end up to see that if you're justified. Mm -hmm. So martial arts requires that responsibility. You have all these techniques that you know, okay, only use it when you absolutely need to, not because you need to make some money, but you need to use it because you need to defend yourself. Use it then. But when you do use it, you still need to be justified in why you used it. So if somebody, you know, just piss you off, called you something, said F you, and then you go beat them down, that's not really, in my eyes, that wouldn't really be a justified reason of using your techniques at that moment. But if you're really threatened and somebody came at you with a knife and then you ended up killing them, then that would be justified use in my eyes. Um, but to beat somebody down just because somebody told you to, hey, you know what, I want to see how good you fight. Go ahead and beat that person up. Can you do it? And you go ahead and do it. That's not justified use of martial arts, and that's essentially what case you know combat sport is. Just beating people up because you want to show off, or you want to make money, or whatever the case may be. Um, but using your techniques in a scientific, per you know, for scientific reasons to test out which techniques are effective, which ones aren't, that's justified use as long as you do it in a intelligent and safe way, you know, because. As martial artists, you need to train in techniques that are effective. What's the point of training these techniques that don't even work? So, martial artists would typically, um, they would spar to test out their techniques. But they would spar with somebody that they have good feeling towards. You don't want to spar with somebody that you hate, that you want to kill. You want to spar with people that, that you trust, people that are your friends, people that you know, people that you're not threatened by. And then you test your techniques, and then you get better. That's what martial artists do. You know, so Jet Li, Bruce Lee, you know, those martial artists that go into acting, 
they're more holding to the principles of the martial arts. People that go to cage fighting or whatever combat sport, boxing, wrestling, cage fighting, football, that's not martial arts, it's something else. They might be talented, they might be strong, they might be capable in what, capable in what they're doing, but they're not representing the martial arts because of the decisions that they made as far as what they're doing with the skills that they have obtained. Um, but, you know, but that's pretty much generally, you know, what I feel about it, you know. That goes all the way I mean, back to Osho and this whole idea of light and dark and because this has been combat sport or fighting, killing for fame and fortune. Time man came on the planet, man. I mean, go back to all the empires and cage fighting and gladiators. combat gladiators and all that, you know. So that so that just shows how long man has been in darkness. If MMA is darkness and cage fighting is darkness and martial arts is light. Yeah, there's gotta be a contrast. And there's always gonna be. So there, you know, before K I mean way before cage fighting. You know, people in, in China that practice Kung Fu, they kill each other in the streets, you know, fighting on the streets. So that's not any better than cage fighting. If anything, that's worse. So it's not just, I'm not just targeting cage fighting. I'm just tar I'm targeting cage fighting, targeting the MMA because it's gotten so global and so popular. That's why I'm targeting, you know, because it's a multi-billion dollar industry, not just a million dollar industry, multi-billion dollar industry and because of that, because it has such a huge influence in the world, that's why I'm targeting it because it's influencing so many people's minds towards, in my eyes, the wrong path. And that's, that's a concern, especially for somebody who loves the martial arts and cares about the martial arts. You want to protect the spirit of the martial arts, but this driving force, this entertaining industry is destroying the spirit of the martial arts until the point where it, get, it becomes a, a blip, you know, it's just gone. So people will forget about if even Bruce Lee even existed. They just keep talking about cage fighting and martial arts is just done. And that's sad because it's heading towards that. Just all people care about is the boxing and the cage fighting and pro wrestling and it's sad. You know, but it's not martial arts. It might be entertaining. Some people might rather watch a boxing match than martial artists sparring because it's more entertaining. There's more violence. There's more blood. People want to see people angry. You want to, you know, you even want to watch lions hunt for their prey and kill other animals. It's entertaining for people. You don't want to see lions just chilling there, enjoying the sun, <laughs> just chilling, eating, eating, eating food at the zoo. You don't gotta, you don't gotta hunt nothing. People ain't entertained by that. You know they want to see like knockouts. They want to see like viciousness. Violence. Yeah, they want to see violence. See someone hop over the cage and get eaten, get mauled. I'm just like right now, people. Are, this is not gonna get like. Um, Freaking, this is not gonna go viral, these stretching we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh shit, did you see that video? This dude was stretching. <laughs> she went viral. <laughs> but I bet you if I freaking break somebody's nose right now, like, that shit might go viral. Shit, you like. <laughs>
But you know, it's not even enough anymore. That's why they're like, they want to see, like, you know, like those murders that happen at Facebook Live? They <laughs> yeah. want to see stuff like that now. <laughs> you heard about that, right? They want to see Real somebody get murdered and lot like live. Yeah. And that's ha actually happening. Yeah. Like, MMA is, 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 is in the past now. Like, it's not even entertaining to people anymore. They've seen that, done that. They want something more than that. And that's where the society's heading. They want to see, like, straight straight up death like facebook live death now the next the best after that is just real death like right in front of your face <laughs> they want to see that you know oh, gladiators yeah the movie that came out called purge or something like that yeah no, i heard that's that. like uh, i i went i went um to, back to the criminal justice lab i said that it's not that it's against the law I didn't know it was a movie. <laughs> oh, she was really talking about doing something like that. Oh, you know? Laws change like crazy, man. I know. What's perfect?